Hello and welcome to Tell Me How You Did It. I'm Namrita Zakaria and I'm here to bring to you my hand-picked list of some of India's finest brands. Yes, our best homegrown companies that can compete with the world's best and still win the battle hands down. These companies range from food, fashion and film to home, art and design. I'm only too happy to talk to the founders who not only chased their rainbows, they also made India proud. Make sure you tune in at hdsmartcast.com week after week to shake the hands that built our best businesses. Listen to them tell me how they did it. A few years ago, fashion mogul Sabhisachi Mukherjee told me of a lady he met at the Bhubaneswar airport. She came up to him and she fell at his feet. She said to him that her husband came into great wealth copying his designs. So what she did was she put Sabhisachi's photo alongside all her assorted gods in this little temple in a house and she prayed to him every day. I was gobsmacked at the story and I repeat it in almost every article I've written on him since. I mean, we know about Sabhisachi's numbers, right? He's constantly in the business papers. We know of his several hundred crores in his kitty, but this sort of hero worship is is unusual. In India, it's usually relegated to like movie stars and cricketers, but for a fashion designer, I've seen it for the first time. Sabhisachi is here with me today. He's here with us today, hot on the heels of great success and a little bit of controversy to tell us how he does it. Sabia, welcome to my podcast. Welcome to tell me how you did it. I hope you're in the mood of spilling some serious beans. Thank you, Namrata. Uh, you know, it's a very difficult question to answer. I still don't know how I did it. It's a lot of hard work, a lot of dedication, a lot of sacrifice, but plenty of luck as well. And uh, I also think that, uh, uh, you know, along the way, I realized that, you know, when you build a brand, it's no longer just about the product. It's about how you conduct yourself with the press, how you tell a story, how you market the brand, which in India, sometimes people think is a very wrong word. And, uh, you know, like to be successful as a designer or a design entrepreneur, one needs to check many boxes. It is, it is not just about product and design and, and only, it's about the ethos of the brand, it's about communication, it's about understanding how the world is moving, where the world is moving, what uh, it, it, it is about uh, having a connect with the audience. And also uh, it is about creating an aspiration with a product that is transient. I like how you attribute it to luck because 2021 has been a remarkable year for you. You started it with the mega announcement of Aditya Birla Fashion and Retail buying a majority stake in your company. Just last week, your long awaited collaboration with H&M was launched internationally. You really make us believe in God. You know that, right? Well, I believe in God, Namrata. I'm very grateful to Mr. Kumar Mangalam Birla because, you know, we had this ongoing dialogue for the last three, four years because when I, when I turned 45, I'm 47 now, I had decided that, you know, I would start uh, looking at this business from the point of posterity. I... Uh, you know, I, 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 I don't have any children. I, uh, my family is not very interested in the business that I do. And many designers uh, have been selfish enough to keep the brand just to themselves. And then, you know, uh, the brand dies a painful death when they cannot handle the business anymore. And I, 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 I wanted, you know, I wanted Sabisachi to be about not just about me, but about everybody. And I say that, you know, this is the time when we start sowing the seeds of uh, creating a business that can last beyond my generation. And uh, Mr. Birla saw merit in it. And uh, we decided that we'll work together. And I'm very, it, the timing couldn't have been better because, you know, we had started speaking about a year before the pandemic. Of course, the deal happened a little let, later because every one of us went into a tizzy. And then, you know, good things happen to people who wait. H&M happened. The deal happened. I'm we still have happy. four months left to 2021 getting over. So any more shockers coming up? Uh, you know, if, if, if time was correct, I would, have, uh, I would have actually opened a store in New York by now. But I think it's going to get delayed because of the pandemic. 
Uh, we've just opened a jewelry store, luxury jewelry store in Dubai. And, uh, uh, but this is the year when we are going to actually start uh, focusing on creating a much more stronger backend. Because I think there are certain years you grow where there are certain years you consolidate. I think this has been a great learning experience for all of us. The pandemic has taught us many lessons. It is important for growing businesses to learn from the pandemic and apply these learnings into business so that you know you can run a better and a more, uh, you know, um, a more successful business in future. I have to ask you right here, right now, about the controversy that ensued. Um, after your H&M launch, a bunch of artisan related NGOs got together and collectively wrote you an open letter on their social platforms, criticizing you of tying up with a fast fashion brand. You know my thoughts, right? I've already written about it. Um, I've, I've even shared, uh, you know, I've even posted about it. And I, I actually quite agitated about this Brahmanical bullying and this sort of ganging up. I just think it's unpleasant. It, reflects very poorly on them. But I, I, ha I want to know your thoughts. I want you to tell all of us what you are going through, because on one hand, to be celebrated internationally is wonderful. And on the other hand, to be, you know, pilloried in your own country, um, it must be confusing or angering or whatever you feel. It's confusing at number, but I don't know if it angers me because you know I've long gone past that stage because I think I've been controversy's child at least in fashion, <laughs> and you get used to it, uh, you know. And I also think that you know when you become a very powerful brand, everybody's going to have an opinion, and you, you as the owner of the brand, you need to man up to learn to take it, you know, the good with the bad with the ugly. But having said that, you know, when H and M actually came to me, you know, there are a lot of questions about uh, about them about sustainability about, you know, some, I knew that, you know, uh, I would be sent to the doghouse if I did the collaboration. I, I knew what, 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 what's going to happen, but I still did it. And I'm surprised I did it. you say that because I think it's a lot of fuss over nothing. No, I, I, it is a lot of fuss over nothing, but I think that, you know, here we are all missing the bigger picture. And I'll tell you why I did it. See, H&M has a very a simple business model. They do, uh, they do a collaboration with a very powerful designer in a region who has a massive following, but probably doesn't have a business of scale to be able to uh, 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 reach out to that following. And they do these collaborations only once with each designer. And I was very clear that I wanted to be a part of the collaboration. And I'll tell you why Namrata, because you know, it pains me that after being in this industry for so long and after, after having, uh, you know, we have so many, so much resources, there's so much history, there's so much heritage we have never been able to cross over and create a very strong brand out of India. For the longest time, we have been producers. We have never been able to helm a brand. People have come from outside. They have taken things from India and they have created great brands, but we have been reduced as manufacturers. And for me, it was a personal mission to be able to attempt to change that once in my lifetime. I also thought that, you know, a collaboration of the scale would sensitize people to India. It would open up many doors of dialogue. And uh, let's talk about the Sanganer print, for instance, you know, the, you know, the issue of controversy. I think that craft has a place. And for me, it has a place in luxury. For the last 20 years, irrespective of all the criticism that people say about me, they cannot refute the fact that I've single-handedly in many ways, and I, I speak about it with no arrogance, just with honesty, that I've raised the bar of craft in the country. You know, I worked, started working with Banaras a very long time ago. And if you speak directly to a lot of viewers in Banaras, they will say, yes, because of Mr. Mukherjee, the prices of Banarsi saris have gone up. I've partnered with Bollywood because I know the kind of image making that is necessary in India, because, you know, Bollywood is almost like a very big subculture. In fact, for Indian weddings, whether you know whether it was bringing the Gota Patti back or the Kirna back on the Pikas Dupatta, or whether it was telling, collaborating with Anushka actually to do a, make her wear a Banarsi sari, of which millions of copies have been made by now. I've always championed craft, and my thing is very simple. I'm like, why is it that when handmade in Italy, when handmade in France, handmade anywhere in in the world, 
has such expensive price tags and such great marketing has been created around it. Why do we have to resign craft and not pick up the uh, to to a uh, uh, to a high street level and not pick up craft uh, to luxury? I think that you know customers today are very very intelligent. They're very aware. They know exactly what is going on. And like, I remember, you know, I used to go and buy Calvin Klein underwear from Bangkok, fake ones, when I didn't have money. And then eventually I aspired to buy the real underwear when I had money. I, you know, I remember we all went to, uh, we all went to Bangkok in the night markets and bought fake logo t-shirts, eventually wanting to buy the real thing. Similarly with craft, I think that, you know, when, you know, today a discerning customer who, who has got into money will probably buy a version of the craft at a digitized level and then buy the real craft at a luxury level at a much better price. And it's a great thing for the economy. It's a great thing for the artisans. It's a great, th you see, because, you know, when craft expands and craft expands at a, um, at a mass level, but the prices go down, who benefits? The middleman benefits. The individual carrier is still getting paid pittance the aggregator benefits. And I think that, you know, what we have tried to do as a brand in a couture level, and, you know, we've done it in so many ways. We've done it, we've, uh, we've done collaborations with uh, Christian Louboutin. We've done collaborations, uh, we have done, uh, we've, we've actually found space in uh, Bergdorf Goodman under the rotunda next to Dior and Chanel, where we sold Karwa Banarsi saris and we showed the finest of Pashmina shawls and everything proudly said handmade in India, because that customer has the money to be able to not only buy craft, but be able to look after it. Like, you know, you're talking about an audience at H&M who would, who would probably not have the luxury of dry cleaning or laundering clothes outside. They would probably put it in the washing machine. Sometimes compliance does not allow you. Price points don't allow you because, you know, when you're talking about a very large brand, you know, a large brand has budgets of marketing, budgets of uh, distribution, budgets of retail, budgets of logistics, budgets of salaries. And you can't really buy something at X and sell it at 2X. You know, probably an NGO can do that because their overheads are lower, but a big, a big multinational can't do that. They probably have to take something at X and price it at 4X or 5X. And that is the nature of the business because you know, business has to be sustainable first for everything else to follow. You know, idealism is wonderful, but idealism can only sustain when there is commerce. Without commerce, idealism is a vague ideal. And I like what you said. Sorry, please finish. No, no, no. Uh, please. No, I like what you said about design and craft being a two-way street because traditionally, historically, you know, craft has come into our language thanks to the patronage of, of the royalty, of the nizams, of the sultans. Um, they have, you know, uh, supported it and, and popularized it, right? Even, even our wedding wear. I mean, there's a reason why we dress up as... Uh, as, as a king and a queen and we sit on the thrones, you know, because we want to emulate what, what the rich did or in our case, what the royal family did. So that whole Raja Rani, Dulha Dulan idea comes from there. And, and also what you said about today's high street customer being tomorrow's luxury customer, because that's how I became a luxury customer. That's how we all became luxury customers, right? Yeah, and, and you know, like much has been said about the H&M Sari. You know, a lot of people, you know, who are, you see, there are a lot of people who are within the fashion fraternity for whom the sari is cool. But there, you know, if we, if we, uh, if we get out of a little bubble of Instagram and look at the big reality outside, a lot of young girls are not wearing a sari. You know, for them, when you make the sari cool, because they all want to be global citizens, you wear a viscose sari today, but you are going to wear a, a Banarsi tomorrow or a silk tomorrow. The idea is to open the doors for dialogue. And I, I, I think that you know when I when I look at when I look at the H and M collaboration, I don't think this collaboration was just about fashion. This was an India collaboration. Very rarely have such large collaborations happened in the in the country. You know, we are looking at markets like. Vietnam, Belgium, France, Italy, Germany, South Korea, you know, Philippines, USA, UK, Italy, Spain, you know, 
about 18 to 20 countries and 42 online markets and everything all sold out under one hour. You know, my friends at the New York Fifth Avenue store said that, you know, they could not get hold of any merchandise. Isn't it a big win for India? And what am I supposed to do as an Indian designer? As an Indian designer, do you want me to sell polka dots and stripes? Or do you want to sell an idea of India? Yes, I've done hybrid versions of the Sanganeri print, uh, married to Tuldeji, married to, married to uh, our chins. But I wanted to show an India that I was proud of in whichever form we did. And today a design student probably sitting in Paris or in London or in Italy or in Spain, who's never heard of the word Sanganer, will probably Google it, find out, let them come to India and let them decide whether they want to do digital or they want to do craft. I think exposure is the most important thing. Exposure leads to greater dialogues, leads to greater uh, uh, commerce and commerce with commerce sustaining so many things can sustain. I think there is a place for technology in the world. Technology is coming in because we have one big problem in the world, which is population. Technology probably will help you with population because at the end of the day, Namrata, everybody needs clothes. You know, we talk about we talk about sustainability, but we very, very well know that it's going to be a never ending dialogue because there is so much of dichotomy in uh, sustainability. Sometimes producing sustainable does not mean the uh, consumption is sustainable. Sometimes when you're not producing sustainably, your consumption becomes sustainable. And, and, it's and contradictory. In many, many ways, it's contradictory. Yeah. I think people have a very myopic way of looking at, uh, looking at sustainability. You need to look at it holistically. And sustainability means different things for different economies. We all want to save the planet. But you know, uh, you know the, uh, we had a we had a, a great bengali poet shukant i think it was shukanto bhartal i do not want to misquote but i think it was shukanto he said something about the bengal famines he said that you know today when i'm hungry i want to say goodbye to poetry i have no art inside me anymore no idealism left because every time i look at a moon it reminds me of a roti oh and oh that's just painful yeah and and that is the reality of the world today. Yeah. A lot of people can afford to talk about sustainability, but a lot of people can't. It's all economics. And different different people in you know, like it's very easy to globalize everything on all perception and say this is right and this is not right. Step into people's shoes, step into yeah. consumer shoes, step step into different economic landscape, and then stand on a wall and shout out. Yeah. I totally, I totally hear you, and that is also why you know I, I started the fundraiser I did, Baradri, because you know for us in India, economic sustainability, rural economies, you know, stirring that sort of sustainable livelihood is the most important thing that we've not been able to, to to do for seventy five years. I mean, we're just not able to get out of that chronic poverty cycle. But I would like to ask you, and if you would like to tell And me. before that, I would just like to intervene. I have so many people calling me who are asking me to want to know more about Chins and Sanganer. Because I'm saying, you know, what is important? You know, there, there, is a, there is a Hindi saying that I've always used as a part of my marketing mantra. What does it mean? Which, which means you first have to like something to appreciate the intrinsic quality of it. I wanted people to get exposed to the India that I was proud of in whichever matter it didn't matter and let them discover India and let them decide. You know, like I said, a lot of people, if you speak to a lot of design students today in the country, a lot of people will say, I love technology. For every Manish Arora, there is a Sabhya For every modernist, there is a traditionalist. Why, why, why does one have to cancel the other? Yeah. What is your relationship with the artisan? How many do you employ? How many do you outsource from? And what is the financial equation that you share with them in terms of wages or salaries? Just can you throw some light on, on this? Yes, Namrata. We have 1,600 karigas right now, 1,600 people em directly employed in the company. Employed? Employed, directly employed uh, within, the, within the company. 1600. That's an enviable number. Yes, but the more enviable number is the people that we outsource from. It's close to 7,500 people all over India. And I'm very proud to say that the number multiplies by quite many hundreds if you look at the copy market. 
<laughs> I yeah. would say a couple of million. But you know, when you when you shared last year, and you were the first designer to do this during the lockdown, that you know to publicly make the sort of commitment that all your employees would be paid uh, through the lockdown. I mean, that was very uh, responsible and also seemingly impossible of you because it's hard to do, right? Everything economically stood still for three, four months, but you publicly made that sort of commitment. No, Namrata, even today, I have to say we had to let go of a few people. It is not that we didn't, but with the promise, we gave them, we, you know, uh, I think we paid people till the end of September, October. And, uh, and it, was, it was a lot of money because the company was bleeding. And, but we still kept a lot of people, at least 60% of the people were working from home. A lot of people are still getting salaries, but they still haven't managed to come in because, you know, we are running our workshops at 50% capacity. That's the mandate of the state government. And uh, having said that, one of the reason, you know, why this, why, one of the reason why this uh, investment came at such a right time was I spoke to Mr. Birla. He's, he's very, very respectful of what we've built. And, you know, I'm looking at the changes that ABFRL is bringing in, you know, changes in HR, changes in the way they are looking into, uh, you, know, you know, I could only manage a certain kind of insurance, but they're, they're bringing insurance, not just for the, the workers, but they're for their families, they're bringing in health insurance, they're, uh, they're uh, uh, bringing in financial security, you know, they're coming up with uh, policies where they can give them, uh, give them better support system to improve their careers. And what they, you know, uh, Mr. Billa, his daughter, a lot of them work in, uh, Mr. Billa's daughter works in the microfinance sector. They're doing a lot with craft and artisans. And I think it's a work in progress. And it's going to be an ongoing commitment from our side that in years to come, we are going to work with more and more craftspeople. We are going to help them with healthcare, with education, with banking. So that, you know, my, my uh, you know, I have never really believed in charity. So this never, is human capitalism. This is correct. ethical capitalism, right? Correct. I've not believed in charity because I think charity somehow, you know, for me is somehow, uh, it's, it's about not letting the, letting a person be empowered. I think if you really want someone to sustain, just empower them to stand on their own feet. Yeah. And, and that is what we try to do. Uh, you know, uh, we we are also going to start setting up small micro businesses for some of our craftspeople so that while they work for us, they can work for other organizations also. Chanel has managed to do that, you know, with their ateliers where the, the first right of refusal comes from Chanel and then they can work with other people. We are not only going to do that, we are probably going to at a time uh, uh, much later probably do global collaborations where we can probably facilitate artisans to produce for global companies. And you know there is only that much that you, you need, but the rest can all be employed by other people. And I that is just that is game changing. It's fantastic. And my job, as a designer, at least in my lifetime, is to raise the bar of craft in this country. I think if I can take a sari from a price point of five rupees to fifty rupees, the entire ecosystem benefits. You know, I remember as I raise my prices more and more, I bring in better and better quality. I, the, you know, we spend so much money in creating the brand. The copy market rises. As the copy market rises, there, there is more and more and more people who, who get employed. I keep telling people that don't stop commerce. It's not a bad word. You have to understand without commerce, nothing survives. When, with commerce, with ethical capitalism, with, uh, with uh, creating a sort of uh, 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 empowerment, for people at lower levels, everything will grow. And, you know, I have a long-term view of business, not a short-term view of business, which is probably one of the reasons why we have been successful. Because I say that, you know, it's, it's like a people tree movement. You can't really rise up without taking people along with you. There are many people in my organization who are incentivized on top line. Because they're incentivized on top line, they all think it's their business. You know, you, you speak to some of the people in my, uh, in my company, they believe that they own the company more than I do. And I think it's a great thing. That's wonderful. Can you tell me about the moving parts um, uh, about your Aditya Birla deal? Like, are you going to mass manufacture or is it um, a horizontal expansion with makeup and jewelry, accessories, which you know, you've had a phenomenal year with accessories as well, home decor. Give us some details. 
I think it's going to be a horizontal expansion first. I I am not going to do ready to wear at the moment, but I'll never say never because you know you don't you know the world changes so furiously. You never know what might happen, and I I do not uh, you know some the pandemic brought us to our knees. You know if something like that happened again, you got, God only knows what we'll be forced to do because it took all our dignity away. And uh, but right now it's all about horizontal expansion. We want to do beauty because I think there's space for Indian beauty in the world. We want to do fragrances. We want to do eyewear. We want to do jewelry. Jewelry is going to be a very big push for us because, you know, I started off as a jeweler and I have a and I I I I think I understand jewelry better than many people in the industry, and it's been a passion for me. And we are going to grow jewelry at every single uh, level. You know, uh, you know, from entry level to uh, to uh, couture, and. Uh, did you know that your jewelry vertical would be this huge? You said to me in an earlier interview that you made more money making jewelry in one year than you did in like a decade of making fashion. Yeah, you know, like uh, uh, you know, in the in the third year of the business, second or third year of the business, we almost touched hundred crores in jewelry. You know, uh, it it's been a slow growth because there people are always suspicious. You know, there there has been a lot of ganging up against me with the jewelers in the country. But if you if you hashtag Sabisachi today, you'll see more more fakes of my jewelry than you'll see fakes of my clothes. So that's becoming a big industry, and I'm very proud to say that you know we've been only in the game for two years. We've had windows in Fifth Avenue, we've had Bergdorf shutting down, and people selling for the selling high jewelry for the first time on Fifth Avenue. Uh, you know there were girls who came, they begged Bergdorf to open the store for them, and they actually sold the jewelry. On pavement, they've never done that before. That it sounds was, comical. Yeah, it was. It I think it was reported by New York Times or by Vogue.com. I'm not sure which one. And then today, you know, uh, with uh, we we have started a jewelry store with Bayat Damas. There, there, the CEO of the project is a CEO who's ex uh, CEO of Hermes watches and jewelry, and uh, we share a pride of place with brands like Mikimoto and Graf. You know, stalwarts in the industry, yeah. and we are the only designers from India, only jewelers from India, and uh, we are going to be opening a New York store, which has is going to have a very strong section for flagship, flagship for jewelry, and uh, in years to come, the aspiration is to become the Cartier of India. Well, there's a lot of room since some most of the jewelers are in hiding uh, or in jail. Tell me about the Bengal tiger motif. You know, it is. And I'm saying this as a commentator, as a as a market watcher. It is in you know Indian fashion's first recognizable logo. Why did you feel the need to have a logo? Because it's a very old marketing, uh, you know, shtick. But in fashion, I've never seen anyone do it um, at this level where, you know, it's just become. It's you don't need to say Sabisachi. It just has. It's just, it's just the logo. It's just the tiger. I think it's brilliant. You've answered the question, Namrata. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, the idea was to find something where people could say Sabesachi without saying Sabesachi. And also it's a difficult name to pronounce. You know, when, when the label goes worldwide, it'll be easier for people to say probably the Tiger brand rather than Sabesachi. And it's a, you know, and it's a beautiful logo. It's very powerful. It's very India proud. It's very Bengal proud. And I wanted to do something that stood for India and stood for West Bengal where I come from. And, uh, this logo was also plagiarized. Like, I remember going to I I remember going to the Alipur Zoo, and you know, uh, there's a very handsome tiger that sits atop the National Library, a sculpture, and I looked at that and I said, a version of this is going to be my logo because it just it just made me feel you know it just it was just so powerful standing alone on its own, a solitary creature in the afternoon sun in Calcutta. And you know, sometimes you just know. So I came back home and I sketched the logo and we did this show called Big Love and the rest is history. Lovely. Excuse me for being vulgar, but how do you make money? Do you have some sort of Midas touch that everything you attempt pretty much turns to gold? I mean, everyone says, you know, Sabya is a great businessman, but what does it really mean? I mean, it's also a little annoying in, in a reductive sort of way, like as if you're just sitting on one gadi and counting money, like what? how do you do it? Like, how do you really uh, 
you know, turn an idea into a success story? Empathy. 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 You know, I, I was born middle class. And when you're born middle class, you know, no matter how rich you become or how powerful you become, these values never leave you. Every time I make something, I tell myself, why will people spend money trying to achieve that? You know, a lot of people actually look at the intrinsic value of a product and say, oh, this is expensive. This is not expensive. By that logic, uh, Chanel wouldn't have sold. Hermes wouldn't have sold. You know, I think what people don't do is they don't invest in the ecosystem of luxury. You know, you need to you need to not only focus on a product, but you need to focus on the storytelling, the experience, the advertising. So today, when I dress up a Deepika Padukone or a Priyanka Chopra or an Ishwarya Rai, when my clothes go to Khan, when I'm at Bergdorf, when I'm doing things, even somebody who's buying, let's say, a belt from me, which is at entry level, will feel that they're a part of that story. I think, I think the only way to make money is to invest money, which a lot of people don't do. You know, a lot of people want returns without giving anything back. I, I, I think the most, there's a very simple organic principle of business. You need to put in money to get money. And I've never been shy of that. At times when my turnovers were very small, I knew, you know, when I, I remember when I opened my large Bombay store, my business wasn't that big, but I had a vision. I was like, why do people who come in luxury cars like Rolls Royces and, and, and Jaguars and want to spend five or six lakhs on clothing, why do, why do they have to go into a store that looks like a garage? Why is there no experience? And this is the same customer from India who's going to the Louis Vuitton stores and the Chanel stores. Why can't we give them similar experiences? I took off a lot of my marketing budget to put it in the store. And you know, the stores have catapulted the business. And I keep telling people one thing. I say that, you know, a lot of people, you know, you need to be a little detached about money. Yeah. If you're always going to be counting pennies, you'll never be able to grow a business. It's very important to have a vision and to feed that vision with money so that the vision actually, it's, money is like a fertilizer. You want to plant a tree. You need to give fertilizer to it to be able to let the tree bloom and the fruits will come back and you can sell the fruits and you can make more money. I think people need to understand the importance of being able to invest in their vision and their businesses and money will happen. This also brings me to brand building. I mean, what does it mean to you? Because a lot of people use it very loosely, you know, if they, if they didn't make money or I did it for brand building. But, you know, you have nurtured your label, nurtured your company. Um, it's, no, it's no short of an empire. So is this what you had dreamed of when you started? And how did you go about achieving this brand story? Because to me, as an outsider, it seems slow. It seems sure-footed. Sure it seems very meticulous. So, tell me how you know how you planned it. You know, Namrata, I've always had a very strong sense of self. And what bothered me always was the fact that we've never been able to build superlative brands out of India. One of the big brand, one, 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 one of the things in luxury that I admire from India is the Oberoi Hotels, you know, because it was singularly run by one man and he put us on a position of pride. And I've said that in many of my interviews, I look up to him. I look up to Mr. Oberoi. And, uh, you know, there are such fabulous tales of him of changing the plumbing all over the hotels in Delhi so that, you know, the water could come, you know, the water could heat. Uh, you know, th there's a certain way he wanted certain room sizes, you know, he didn't, he had an opportunity of uh, doing hotels with larger amount of rooms, but he deliberately kept them, uh, kept the rooms larger, but the number of rooms smaller. So he could give people that sense of luxury. You know, I think you need to be a little giving to be able to create a brand and you need to have an exemplary vision. And for me, I say one thing to people, I said that, you know, brands are things that last. You know, if you want to make money, you can have a short-term view of making money or a long-term view of making money. And after you make a certain amount of money, number the money for a lot of people like us is just mere statistics. What you want to actually leave behind is a legacy. For me, that was very important that, you know, when I look back, you know, when I'm lying alone in a hospital bed, when I'm not well, and I know that it's my time to go, I want to look back and say that, you know, in my lifetime, 
I at least had a shot. I, I at least tried to create a difference and I tried to create something that would last. If I can do that, I feel very privileged. Sapia, how do you deal with your copycats across fashion, jewelry, accessories? You, in your 20 plus years, you've been the most copied designer from the, from the first year and, and I've watched you since then. Um, you know, your aesthetic is, has been in every bridal shop the gazillions of them across the country, your dark colors, the dull gold embroidery, the mismatched prints, you know, your beautiful vintage borders. Now your handbag, and I know we shared this, uh, you know, on WhatsApp uh, a month ago when, you know, your handbag was spotted at one of the Delhi's, lo you know, local bazaars along with uh, a Dior and a Michael Kors. How do you deal with it? You know, you have to deal with it by be becoming a realist. When you come out with a beautiful idea, if you do not have the bandwidth to reach out to everybody who aspires to be a part of the idea, somebody else will fill in. While copying is annoying, but you have to understand something that the, the you will only fear the copy market if you have not built a brand where people will aspire to buy you at the real price. You know, today, I don't worry about the copy market anymore because of the fact that I know that my customers and a, and a lot of my customers like the digitized Sanganeri print are coming from the copy market into, into, into the Sabisachi brand. I'll give you an example. A lot of girls probably wear uh, Sabya copy number one or two or three for their friends' weddings or for their sister's weddings. But when it comes to their real wedding, their own weddings, they come to the brand because they say, well, maybe just once in my life, I'll be able to buy or wear a sabya. And I think the copy market in many ways has been a great advertiser for the brand. You know, they are silent adver advertisers because they're constantly telling other people that how good you are, then that's the reason why they have to copy you. I think it's, it's, it's a great factory and it's, it's also great uh, in terms of business marketing. What one needs to do is one needs to be ahead of the curve by all, the question is not about what will you do about the copy market. The question is what will you do to your own brand so that people want to buy you and not buy, want to buy a copy. A lot of people get that math wrong. Worldwide, just imagine what would happen to Chanel or Louis Vuitton if there were no copies sold anywhere in the world. They would be very disappointed. <laughs> You've told me before that Savya Sachi, the company doesn't belong to you. It belongs to the country. What do you mean by that? Look at the kind of, look at the kind of um, reactions we cause in people. From very loved to very hated. It all happens when people have an ownership on your brand. You know, you know, like much like well loved brands. You know, I I I keep saying that you know, if a cricketer manages to lose a World Cup match no matter how good the person has been throughout his career, becomes a national terrorist. You know, like, I, I think when you become powerful, you become powerful because of the love of all people. And you also need to understand that the people who uh, make you are also the people who can pull you down. And I'm very cognizant of that. I, I, I keep telling people that, you know, today, you know, I have a lot of NRIs who get married in my clothes and they come back and say that, you know, when we go to, when we go and meet other communities in the countries that we stay in, we show your work and we say, this is India. I think a lot of people take pride in the brand and, uh, and I'm very humbled. You know, Bowman Irani had once said to me in a, in a chat show, that he said that you know while other biz other designers and other businesses have customers you have fans mm -hmm. you know it's scary because you know it puts a lot of weight on your shoulders but i think that probably puts me in a correct path that maybe i've done something good in my life to receive this kind of adulation and i'll try to work hard and you know honestly this h m collaboration i come back to that was actually to give people a sense of pride that if he can do it so can we, and it doesn't have to be in fashion. It could be in music, it could be in architecture, it could be in food, it could be in anything. I think 
India deserves to have nationwide, worldwide recognition. It's about time. I think a lot of us, whether there are actors, musicians, writers, we all need to push forward for more and more global acceptance. I remember this Bowman interview because I was part of it. You critiqued me very strongly on it. What did I say? I forgot. You spoke about how um, I wrote a piece uh, in the first year of your launch and how you didn't speak to me for a year and you pasted it uh, in your office. Do you remember that story? You've told it yes. to me. Yes, like Sabe has reinvented himself as the next best thing after the singer sewing machine, something like that. And you know, it was my first piece of criticism. I was very rankled by it because nobody likes to be criticized, but I kept it on my board and I said, I will never let this allow, uh, allow myself to happen again, uh, allow this to happen to me again. I ate humble pie, Namrata, because you were completely right. You know, while everybody else praised me, you're the only one who cut me into pieces and I deserve to be. And and a lot of people, you know, I, ha I hear a lot of chatter that, you know, I'm not, I'm not someone who takes criticism well. That's absolutely not true. You can never succeed or you can never rise if you're not listening to stories. You know, I am absorbing all the conversation around H&M and, and I'm sure that somewhere everybody will reach a middle path where the modern and the old commerce and art can all coexist hand in hand. There is space for everybody. What's next? for Sabya Sachi, the company and Sabya Sachi, the person? Okay, for Sabya Sachi, the person, I need to get a little bit of biceps. You know, I've never looked at, <laughs> I've never looked at my own personal health. So I'm running on a treadmill every day. I started enjoying giving back to myself so much. You know, I run seven kilometers every day on my treadmill. I have never understood the benefits of health. You know, I was pre-diabetic. I have very chronic thyroid, which slows down my brain. And you know, it's very difficult uh, for the left side and the right side of the brain to be completely aligned and working together when you have conditions like thyroid, it slows you down. But now since I've started working out, I've started feeling a lot better. And about the brand, I'll only say two words, global domination. To that, I, I raise my glass to you. I doff my hat to you. Thank you for speaking to me in, I think, what has been your most tumultuous week of the year or the last few years. Um, I really appreciate it and I wish you nothing but the best. Thank you, Namrata. If you enjoyed the show or not, write to me on Instagram, Twitter or Clubhouse at Namrata Sitar. For updates on Tell Me How You Did It, follow us at HD Smartcast. We're on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and Clubhouse. To listen to more podcasts, log on to hdsmartcast.com or suno nai nazariye se.